This is NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Kia Miakonatis. When I was in college, this thing kept happening to me. Classmates would rush up, surprised and almost alarmed, to tell me, I saw a girl who looks just like you. Yeah, I'd explain, kind of amused. I have an older sister. She goes here too. Though we're not twins, we do look a lot alike, but we're different in so many ways. Siblings can be like funhouse mirrors, a reflection of who you might have become had the genetics tilted in a different direction. Today, we've got two books that center siblings, including a novel about a pair of sisters who live near a quarry locals call The Killing Pond. That's later, but first, Ari Tyson's new YA book, Saints of the Household, tells the story of two Bri Bri American brothers who wrestle with the weight of violent abuse from their past that is now spilling over into their present and threatening to derail their futures. This is Tyson's debut novel, and it's told in vignettes and poetry. Here she is with NPR's Miles Parks. What is it about high school that can make you feel so alone even when you're surrounded by so many people all the time. Ari Tyson's young adult novel, Saints of the Household, centers on two brothers in Minnesota who are navigating that very specific isolation in their own ways. Ari Tyson, thank you so much for joining Weekend Edition. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. So I wonder if we can start there. Can you just introduce us to these two brothers, Jay and Max, less than a year apart, both are seniors in high school, but are very different? Yeah. So the two brothers are, you know, written in two points of view. So we get a dual narrative that way. One's written in vignettes. The other one is written in poetry. And the kind of form kind of exhibits who they are. Jay is really, really smart. He's an observer of the world. And uh, he kind of has a a little bit of a mathematical brain. Um, And so he has, uh, yeah, he tends to focus on things in kind of short, heavier spurts. And then we have Max, who's just this dreamy, artsy boy um, who loves to paint. And he is expressed in poetry. Yeah, and as a family, their mother is a member of the native Costa Rican tribe, the Bribri. And Throughout this book, they're subject to horrible abuses by their father, who is white. And I wonder, can you talk a little bit about how those abuses manifest in in both of them throughout the book? Yeah, I think, you know, they tend to be struggling in that sense of their whole identity is kind of upended by this. But at the same time, I think the book is really them trying to figure out who they are beyond the abuse and what happens when the monster gets kind of put away and who do they get to be after that. The writing in this book conveys such empathy for these two boys, and it's really powerful to read. But I'm I'm curious uh, to ask about a third character in this book, this character Luca, who is kind of the villain of the book. He is the star of the soccer team. He is clearly edging towards some abusive tendencies in his relationship uh, with the boy's cousin. Did you empathize with Luca as well in this book? You know, I think so. I think I knew people like Luca. In fact, in some ways, I think I was a lot like him in the sense that I was very friendly and I, you know, I played soccer and maybe I was one of those folks with woo, you know, right? I I was just, that was who I was. But you can do a lot of damage with that kind of personality sometimes, right? And people don't always expect it. I think we all do harm. Uh, That's my own human belief, right? I think we all do harm and we all do good. Um, Some of us do more than others. And so I think Luca was in that space for me. Um, He had to be a scapegoat for a lot of things for the boys. But also, I, you know, at the end of the day, I do kind of, as the writer, I guess, wish him well. I hope I hope he figured things out. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, I want to turn to the women in the book. Um, It seems like to me there's a parallel between the boy's mother who is stuck in this physically abusive marriage um, and then the boy's cousin who is dating Luca for much of the book who is also exhibiting some kind of problematic tendencies. Is that a mirror or a parallel that that was apparent to you as you were writing it? Well, their mom came first and Nicole actually came out in later revisions. And I think for sure their mom and her are in conversation their mom doesn't have the tools that Nicole has. Um, and so the choices that she makes in a generation before are different. Also, 
the people that Nicole has surrounded herself with, her community, her dad, her mom, her family, it's complicated, but it's a good one. It's a healthy one. Um, and so it allows her, I think, to be able to start making decisions for herself that maybe, you know, other generations before, at least in my people group and other spaces, you know, might not have been able to have the power to do. I'm curious that Nicole came later because she's such a key support system for Jay. How did you kind of get to the point where you kind of added a character that helped him through this? You know, I um, thought about my own system and who I have around me who has helped me grow and all that. Um, and I thought about intertribal relationships. For me, right, there's only five Bree-Brees in the US, U.S. So we don't have a huge group of folks that I can kind of lean on here in the States. When I go back home, when I go to my reservation, my land, I absolutely do. But here, not so much. So who has that community been? It's been folks from other tribes around here who get it. And, you know, we can laugh through really tough, crappy stuff like colonization and all that stuff that we, you know, we have mirrors, parallels in our own people groups, I think, of, of very similar issues. I, I think that we do have those people around us, even when we feel alone, that we could lean on. Uh, and I think Nicole is that person for him. Going to this idea of leaning on your tribe as a support system, Jay really finds a lot of solace in his tribe's history, thinking about the stories that have been told for generations. Is that the same for you? And in, in hard times, have you kind of gone back to some of the legends and stories and, and things like that? Oh, absolutely. You know, I did a retelling for another anthology. Um, the retelling was called Bloodkin. It was, a, it was a transformational story about a character who turns into a panther. She comes from a legend where a grandfather and a granddaughter both transformed after their land was getting taken. For me, that story ended up being hugely transformational for my own story in the sense that I could figure out justice. I could figure out ferocity. I could think about how that's really built into my people. And we don't always use it, but we use it when we need to. And that really helps me to get grounded in bravery, especially in spaces of abuse and my own junk in my life. Um, that story, I think about that one often, but there's, you know, we have a story for everything, I joke. So, you know, you could look at a butterfly on the side of the river and we're like, huh. yep, we got a story for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's just the way it is when you're indigenous, you've got stories for everything. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it reminds me of a, a line um, in the book, actually, that I had written down of the hard and good all feel at home with me, which I think is something Jay says late in the book as he's taking stock of everything that's happened. I think that complexity is really powerful. And I wonder, what were you hoping for people that age that what, what they would take away from this book, I guess? Yeah, it's kind of twofold. One, books can be very secretive. You can read them and you, not everybody is looking over your shoulder and reading the book with you. But also, uh, same is true for growing up in an abusive household. Not a lot of people know about it unless you share. And it's really hard to get to that space of sharing. I think that books can reach that space. You know, I, I'm meeting teenagers now because the book's coming out and my whole heart is just kind of growing in a new way <laughs> to think, of, you know, talking to teenagers who have gone through similar things. It's really special to be able to have a book that can speak into those spaces when even I can't, right? I can only talk to a teenager so long, um, but a book, a book can be there with them. Ari Tyson, her new novel is Saints of the Household. Thank you so much, Ari, for joining us. Thank you, Miles. A remote island on Lake Erie with a history of death and trauma is the setting for this next book, The Insatiable Volt Sisters by Rachel Eve Moulton. It's a horror novel, the plot centering around two half-sisters navigating inherited trauma and the monsters that emerge from it. Here's Moulton with NPR's Aisha Roscoe talking about the dangers of growing up female. Being a teenage girl is rough enough. Now try growing up on an isolated island where murderous dangers lurk and unsettling mysteries are commonplace. At the center of this island, there's a quarry and they refer to it as the killing pond. And so it's known for attracting women to its cliffs and sad women and kind of consuming them. Rachel Eve Moulton's new novel, The Insatiable Vote Sisters, follows a pair of half-sisters who desperately want answers and the people who refuse to give them the information they need. Moulton's electrifying horror story starts with a simple premise. 
trauma is always passed down, whether you acknowledge it or not. I'm very interested in the idea of inherited trauma, and these girls definitely inherit this island. And the island itself has been full of trauma, is known for sad incidents or times or disappearances, things of that nature. And so they get to kind of discover what that means and what role they play in it and what role they want to play in it. It's never a good sign when you have something called the killing pond near your house. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's not where you should be raising your children. Um, So much to me of the book hangs on the sisterhood of Beatrice and Henrietta. And they have this very complex relationship, almost like twins, but they're not twins because they're half sisters. But there's also resentment, jealousy, abandonment. Talk to me about that relationship that I feel like so much of the story hinges on. So, I mean, the first thing I'm really interested in a place. And then the second thing, of course, is the relationships. And I'm very interested in how women relate to each other, right? And my, I have wonderful female relationships in my life, and I always have. But the complexity of them is always complicated. It's always layered. So, you know, I should say I grew up in a small town in southern Ohio. And in many ways, I think that little town was an island. They talk about it in real estate as having an island economy, right? It's very small, 4,000 people, lots of artists, some amazing people came out of there. And I grew up with my own family and a brother and my closest friend. I've known her since we were two years old. And our relationship is nowhere near what the Volt sisters' relationship is with each other. But you do draw from that. You're like, okay, the complexity of, of this moment when I was hurt as a child and how do you carry that forward and when did I do right by her and when was she there for me and when did we miss the mark? Those little moments in fiction, you can really go back and explore what that felt like. It felt like there was a monster. It felt like you were ripping each other apart. And so what if you really did? So the father of the sisters, he knew the secrets of the island. These were things that he kept from the girls. You also wonder, and I think it's kind of drawn out in the book, whether it was because they were girls that he wanted to offer this sort of protection. And and sometimes you can try to, quote unquote, protect women, but what you're really doing is not giving them the yes. information they need to make their own decisions, right? You know, I think growing up female feels full of danger, right? There's always something. There's a way you're projecting yourself. There's a way you're not. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. There's a way to be polite. There's a way to be kind. There's all these messages. And then underneath those messages, here's what's really being said. So as somebody who listens a lot and is intuitive and likes to write stories, you're always trying to hear the underneath thing. Why are you looking at me in this t-shirt and panicking about the way I look? What are you afraid of? Am I too sexy, not sexy enough? Can you see my bra? Can you not see my bra? I mean, that's a dumb example. No, but but people, it it can be a big deal. And so getting beneath why, why is it a big deal? Whether I wear a crop top or spaghetti straps or whatever, why does it matter? Well, and then if you put yourself out there as a sexual being, is that powerful? Are you then asking for it? Even in a really healthy environment, you're subject to trying to figure out what's really going on. Like the underlying issues of what isn't said, how people process that information, if you're allowed to talk about it, what is secret, what is not secret. And women's bodies are this incredible thing. But they're also very, as with Henrietta and Beatrice, our bodies are also monstrous in in great and weird ways. And the fact that we don't talk about that, there's so much we still don't talk about, is always been puzzling to me. If you don't watch the horror scene in the movie, the gruesome scene in the movie, whatever I come up in with my head is 10 times worse. So I should have just watched it. Yeah, so then, yeah. If, yeah, if you're in a room with people who are kind of like trying to protect you or acting like they can't quite tell you the truth, oh, you don't, you know, that that feeling is the worst. You know, you talked about inherited trauma, generational trauma. This is something that's like often explored in horror novels. Like, you know, you could think of like Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. Like, why do you think horror is such a common way of addressing the trauma that we carry? Is it because trauma is like a monster? Is that, is that? 
I think part of it is trauma is like a monster. And then I think it does tie back to what are we allowed to talk about and how are we allowed to talk about it? So if I know my grandmother, her mother suffered, I can't remember, eight miscarriages, right? And and so so I have that fact, but we didn't talk about the impact on her. There's one person with one version of trauma and we've never explored it. But in horror, you can start to do that. I think it gives you a foot in the door to talking about things. There's so many things I'll just, you know, here in the U.S. that we don't want to revisit. We don't want to talk about it. We handled it. We're good. And that's never, it's just never true. And I think horror gives you an opportunity to just really like live in it. The girl's father's dying is what brings them back to the island. And and at one point, while his will is being read, Beatrice asks if it's possible to refuse the inheritance of her father's home. And, and that is not possible, she finds. Do you think that in the real world, that that's kind of the way it is, that you can't break the cycle of generational trauma by refusing to acknowledge it, that you have to face it and deal with it? That is certainly my experience, you know, and I'm raising two girls of my own now. So I'm sure there are ways I'm messing it up already, but it definitely feels like you have to face the hard thing. You have to articulate it. Like I tell my daughters, like the shame is one of the worst things, right? (laughs) Feeling shame. It's a waste of time. It's going to hold on to you. So when something happens that makes you feel shame, tell somebody, just say it out loud. And that's your start right? Maybe you don't want to process it, but you say it. And I think a lot of the time when we feel shame about something we've done, about our ancestors, about something our friend did, the shame tells us to shut down, be quiet. And I think that's the wrong way to go. I think you have to talk about it. You have to put it out there because even if there is shame still connected with it after you've said it, it starts to unravel. It starts to lose its power. Naming it And then seeing where it goes is much healthier than pretending it didn't happen. That's Rachel Eve Moulton. Her new book is The Insatiable Vote Sisters. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. This is such a pleasure. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. If you want more, you could sign up for our newsletter at npr.org slash newsletter slash books. I'm Kia Miakonatis. The podcast is produced by Isabel Gomez Sarmiento and Tilda Wilson and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Amiko Tamagawa, Todd Munt, Nina Kravinsky, Rina Advani, Elena Burnett, Christopher Intagliata, Hiba Ahmad, Dee Parvaz, Samantha Balaban, Melissa Gray, and Ryan Bank. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.